fusion of the master's consciousness with that of the disciple. Earlier, I stated that the disciple's private life automatically falls once he has been accepted by the master into three stages. A, the stage in which the lower concrete mind and the higher concrete mind are related in such a manner that the lower mind is not only soul illumined, but is subject also to impression from the spiritual triad. B, his relation to the master is the next and sometimes paralleling stage that involves the bringing together of the master's consciousness and his own. This has to be slowly developed and consciously grasped with very interesting consequences. C, later comes the stage when the disciple's consciousness can be gradually brought into a rapport with the hierarchy as a whole. It might be mentioned in clarification somewhat of this rather vague statement that the disciple is absorbed into the hierarchy and, at the same time, he assimilates in a new and mysterious manner certain united hierarchical impressions. The disciple by now has made his approach to the ashram and has demonstrated his ability to serve and thereby utilize any ashramic energy which he may contact and occultly include. He is slowly becoming aware of three vibratory impressions, which are slightly differing, though colored by the ray which they express. First of all, he is aware of the vibration of his own soul. Then he registers that of the ashram, and the early stage is focused for him through the mediation of some disciple senior to him. And finally, he becomes conscious of the vibration of the master. Slowly he learns to distinguish them and know them as constituting three different channels whereby energy reaches him. They contact his consciousness upon the mental plane. Later, he discovers that contact with them is facilitated once he can register them consciously upon their appropriate plane and through the appropriate center. It naturally takes time to develop this facility, and until he passes through the third initiation when major changes take place, he is expected to retain the impression upon the mental plane. The development of sensitivity to contact and the registering of that which is other than the self and yet which is the self itself are part of the great science of impression. This development in the early stages of human evolution is carried forward through the medium of the five senses and is to be found in the animal kingdom also. With this well-known and well-studied unfoldment, I shall not deal, beyond saying that these five, in reality seven, senses constitute avenues of spiritual approach to varying aspects of the divine manifestation in the three or five worlds of human evolution. It might here be pointed out that, in a mysterious manner, the seven centers in the etheric body are correspondences to the seven senses, for they are responsive to vibrations coming from the world soul or the human soul, from the ashram and from the master, as well as registering eventually the energies of all the seven rays. These pour into the disciple and through him as part of the great circulatory system of the sevenfold divine energy, which is the basis of manifestation. I dealt with these senses and the circulating energies somewhat at length in a treatise on cosmic fire. With the theme of the fusion of the soul and the personality, I have dealt adequately in other writings and in the teaching on the Antikarana. I will confine myself here to the fusion of the master's consciousness, as it is conditioned to the human kingdom, with that of the disciple. There is no fusion possible or comprehensible between the master's higher or shambhalic consciousness and that of any disciple who has not taken the fourth initiation. The completeness of the fusion to which I refer is not possible in the early stages of the disciples' unfoldment. There again the teaching hitherto presented by occult groups in connection with a master's relation to his disciple has been erroneous and the result of wishful thinking. The disciple is only permitted to have contact with the master's mind when his spiritual life has become habitual to him and when he can, at will, flood his personality with soul energy. Those who make occasional and rare soul contacts, and there are many who do, in their, med in their meditation work, are not so privileged. It is the disciple who has established a usable contact with his soul, of which he can avail himself at any time he so chooses, 
who can begin to register impressions coming directly to him from the master. Aspirants must not confuse teaching given to them by the master in the work of the ashram with this later fusion of consciousness. In group formation, disciples are gathered together at times to receive instruction and are thereby protected within the group aura from the tremendous potency of the master's presence. It is difficult for the average aspirant to realize the necessity for this, yet even disciples themselves and in the early stages of their admission to the ashram and of their training have a potent effect upon those whom they may contact. The effect is produced without intention and is caused by the higher quality of the disciple's vibration or radiance to that of the person or group he contacts. The impression he makes produces stimulation, a stimulation which the person frequently finds it very difficult to handle, evoking not only good, but also bad effects. The application of this radiant energy is a definite mode of spiritual service and activity, but until a disciple has advanced in knowledge and can control his radiation, permitting only those streams of energy to escape from him which are appropriate to the need, the passing by of a disciple can produce much difficulty, both for the individual and for the group. It will be obvious to you, therefore, that the presence of a master will have a potent effect where an individual disciple is concerned. I have employed that separative term, individual disciple, because it indicates the cause of the possible difficulty or even danger. Such difficulty is always possible as long as any separative or self-centered instincts exist in the disciple. It takes a long time for a disciple to attain that disinterestedness and that inclusive spirit which will enable him to stand in the presence of the master and present no barriers to direct contact with the master's mind. This contact, leading to the desired fusion, falls into certain clearly defined stages. The first stage, occasionally in the disciples' hours of meditation, at a moment of great tension or any crisis related to his service activities, there may occur a momentary fusion of the minds of the disciple and the master. This can only occur when the mental focus is so steady and so firmly directed in intention that emotional reactions or the intrusion of personality affairs are eliminated. Second, later on in his training, the master may attempt to impress his mind unexpectedly and thus train him to recognize what we might regard as a direct call from the center of the ashram. Third, if the disciple proves his value and demonstrates that he is desiring nothing for the separated self, the interrelation between the two minds of the master in the ashram and the disciple, finds no impediment. There is consequently no risk of overstimulation, of self-satisfaction, or of the emergence of qualities which would disturb the rhythm of the ashram. There can take place, as the master wills it, a flow of thought between the two. At first, the impression is carried forward entirely on the side of the master, and the disciple is simply an agent who can be impressed by, by ideas and instructed along some particular line which may be of service to humanity. He can, however, produce no current of thought flowing back to the master. Later on, as the disciple moves forward into light and is simultaneously a server, he can be permitted to reach the master with his own reaction to the impression. Fourth, then comes the final stage wherein the disciple can be trusted to be the initiatory agent of impression and of contact and is allowed to evoke the master's attention and to penetrate to the center of the ashram. Students would do well to relate these four stages to the six stages of discipleship dealt with in the latter part of Discipleship in the New Age, Volume 1. These four stages correspond to the final four considered in that book. These contacts are naturally in the field of telepathy, which is an aspect of the science of impression and, an entirely, and are entirely in the realm of mental interplay. I have dealt with the basic science itself in the book Telepathy and the Etheric Vehicle. The relation considered above is between the instrument of contact used by the master, that of the higher or abstract mind, for the masters do not work through the lower mind at all, and the lower or concretizing mind, of the disciple. The masters and therefore 
the masters are therefore dependent upon the use of the antikarana, which the disciple is in process of building. This is rapidly becoming a part of the group antikarana, built by disciples, working in the three worlds, but on mental levels, who have been admitted into the ashram. You can see why, therefore, the teaching anent the antikarana was deemed by us to be timely and wise. Relationship to the ashram and contact with the master are dependent upon exist the existence of the antikarana. In the early stages of this of its creative construction, the antikarana is adequate to permit some contact with the ashram and with certain of the disciples, though not with those of very high degree. Later, as the antikarana perfects itself, higher and more durable contacts become possible. It is needless, surely, for me to point out that the theme of all impressions coming from the master to the disciple and from the disciple to the master is the service of the plan, the problems connected with group work in the Aquarian age, or with the life and relationships within the ashram. Forget not that the ashram has its own objectives, intentions, and inner techniques, which are unconnected with the disciple's life and his service in the three worlds. The work of the disciple in preparation for initiation is not basically concerned with his daily world service, though there would be no initiation for him if that life of service were lacking. His life of service is, in reality, an expression of the particular initiation for which he is being prepared. This is a theme too vast for us to consider here, but it is an idea upon which you could well ponder. One hint I will give you based on the life of the Christ. The life history of the experiences of the great initiates are rarely given, but much has been communicated to us in the life of the Christ, both in the Gospels and in connection with his earlier incarnations. As you know, he took one of the greatest of the initiations, the sixth initiation, that of decision. The initiation is related to the throat center and also its higher correspondence, throat center of the planetary logos. This is the center which we call humanity. Thus, the word came forth. He had a dual mission to fulfill in order to prove his fitness, if one may use such a word in connection with an initiate of his exalted standing. He had, first of all, to give a great impetus to human evolution by proclaiming two things. One, that the blood is the life. And two, that all men everywhere are sons of God and therefore divine. Secondly, he had to bring to an end the Jewish dispensation, which should have climaxed and passed away with the movement of the sun out of Aries into Pisces. He therefore presented himself to them as their Messiah, which was his reason for manifesting through the Jewish race. They not only rejected him, but have succeeded in perpetuating the Jewish dispensation through the medium of its religious presentation throughout the era of the Christian dispensation. This lies at the root of their trouble and is the cause of their constant emphasis upon the past, a past which is based on their experiences in Aries and not upon their growth in Pisces. This entire subject of the telepathic interplay between the disciple and the ashram and between the master and the disciple is one of unique interest. It is part of the dual life which all disciples must lead. It is that which intensifies the life of introspection which is only rightly understood and carried forward when the man is in truth a soul-infused personality. It is the source of origin of the extroverted life, which the disciple must also lead, producing an intense activity in the three worlds, an activity which in no way disturbs the calm procedures of the life as shramic contacts. Rightly followed, it produces the possibility with which our third point details.